the first time I heard about uh, John Stuart Mill was this um, quotation from him, which I could never find again. But, uh, yay, extra 20 seconds. But uh, it was basically something to affect that uh, any man can only uh, really kind of live to their full potential if they're invested uh, emotionally in what they're doing. And it really resonated with me back there, but then I think over time it kind of, um, I understood different facets of that. Uh, anyone who has kind of studied liberal arts uh, knows who uh, John Stuart Mill is, but just a quick intro. Uh, he was a philosopher that lived uh, at the end of the Victorian era at, and then when uh, the Industrial Revolution was uh, taking off. So what he was concerned with and a lot of the um, kind of fields of philosophy that he contributed to are very much relevant to us. Uh, he was also uh, kind of a product of a very uh, unique upbringing. His father was also a philosopher, so from an early age he wasn't hanging out with kids. He was a student his whole life. Uh, he kind of learned Greek history, arithmetic at three. By 14, he had completed the whole uh, history, and he knew uh, chemistry, zoology, logic, a few languages, which all of that led to his nervous breakdown at 20, but that's kind of beside the point here. He read poetry and recovered. Uh, some of the notable characters that we now know in kind of our popular culture uh, uh, are very much influenced by his thought, just kind of to show you uh, how much of uh, his contribution to philosophy translates directly into our popular knowledge. So going back to that original uh, quote, uh, what strikes me with his um, kind of body of work is a lot of his ideas are both timeless and very timely for us. Um, because there are kind of these... Um, general principles that will probably stay relevant through time, but also because of how um, our way of living is changing, they find new meanings in our time. And one of them is do what you love and love what you do, which we kind of tend to think it's a recent phenomenon, but in a, in a sense it's not. Um, when you think of uh, people who were doing, uh, who were knowledge workers throughout history, they were actually very much invested in the things they were working on. Uh, we barely think of any uh, scientists, uh, philosophers, uh, writers who are known for the subjects they despised. There are always people that were totally in love with something, and their body of work is actually an embodiment of what they were living for. Um, so now we have this uh, new group of people, the knowledge workers, designers, scientists, entrepreneurs, you name it. Uh, and the paradigm shift is now, um, all of a sudden, a majority of people are knowledge workers, but still our society used to think of themselves as labor. Uh, but what that means is that now we have the chance to kind of bring some of those grander themes or philosophies that back then were thought of mostly for governance and politics and bring them into our life because now we are all knowledge workers and we are self-governing to, uh, to a big extent. Um, so ideas like liberalism, especially in the way uh, that... Uh, Mill was looking at it, uh, utilitarian thought, in the way that now we are very much in charge of our own actions and we can uh, drive a lot of what we do. And also, we are much closer uh, to making things happen. Never in history has been so many small groups of people that now we call startups or small companies that could actually create products that could have so much uh, effect on the society. And then lastly is empirical thought. Now our access to uh, communication is way more improved than what it was at that time. So we can actually look for proof and look for data much easier on something like Google that didn't exist back then. Um, so what, it, what would it um, mean if we were to kind of interpret those grand themes and bring them into how we do business these days? Uh, seems like they all kind of feed into um, the recent practices that we know are really good for business. Uh, so if you have a liberal place of work, that means you have a flat hierarchy. That means you can go up to your boss and kind of brainstorm around an idea. Uh, if you have a liberal place of work, it's also a democratic place, right? You look for producing um, products or taking ideas forward that actually um, have been proven right, either by crowdsourcing uh, or you have some data on it. Um, so it's less of that idea of, creating one black car and wanting everybody to buy it. We are doing Kickstarter now. Um, also, um, utilitarian thought kind of lead, uh, um, uh, lends itself to the idea of uh, being lean and being uh, driven by the results. Uh, in a way, actually, the way 
uh, male thought of ethics, he was kind of an advocate of lean ethics. Uh, his principle around ethics was um, the most ethical decision is the one that drives the most happiness, regardless of what your definition of uh, that is. But uh, if you think of it now, we are looking for products, processes, companies that make the most number of people happy, right? Whether it's inside or outside of that company. Um, also, a lot of uh, empirical and utilitarian thought lends itself to design practices. Iterative design, rapid prototyping, collaboration, all of them are driven by action first and by theory second. Um, and I think that's, that's the gist of it. Um, so I think, <laughs> I'll go on. But I think it's actually uh, good that next time that um, somebody questions the idea of design thinking, the idea of democratic uh, workplace, the idea of flat hierarchy, rather than trying to reference Alan de Bouton or other kind of contemporary philosophers, you can actually kind of look back in history and in philosophy and look at these things as uh, basic human rights and bigger kind of uh, ways of thinking about how we should be living, except now there are so many people being knowledge workers and in control of their own work that we can actually make it happen. Thank you.